Hey there, good to see you. Today in this video, I'd like to share with you uh, some thoughts and some of the things that I think we can all learn, some of the things that I think we can be inspired by, and some of the lessons that we can apply to our own photography by taking a close look at the work created by this guy. Of course, this is Ansel Adams, and this is his book, uh, 400 Photographs, which is a rather literal title. And while looking at this book, I noticed some interesting things about his work, some things that I'd never noticed before. Obviously, I have a, a bunch of images here, a uh, bookmark that I'm going to share with you. Uh, but there's one image in particular. There is one image created by Ansel Adams that has uh, that plays just a very important role in my life. And I, and I don't think I really thought about how important this image was um, in my life until recently, until I got this book. Back in the 1980s, I was about 14, 15 years old. Yes, I know I'm old, um, <laughs> uh, so uh, you don't have to tell me. I was living in my in my parents' home, who lived in this suburban neighborhood with you know green leafy trees, and we lived at the end of a cul-de-sac, this quiet cul-de-sac in this pretty you know, pretty bland uh, kind of area. And you know, being a teenager in the mid 1980s, you know, the bedroom of my uh, the walls of my bedroom. You know, we're decorated with, you know, pretty much all the standard stuff that you would expect. Like I had, you know, posters from the bands I was into at the time, uh, you know, bands like um, like R.E.M., Smith, New Order, all that kind of stuff. I had like, you know, junky street signs and various garbage and things that my friends and I would find, you know, when we're out like riding bikes and stuff. And there was a time in which I believe it was around 14, if I'm remembering this right. There was a, a moment in which I was I was talking to my mom about it and I said to her that, you know, it'd be nice to have something that was like a little more artistic, <laughs> like something a little bit nicer. Remember, this is the 1980s. So like this is before the Internet. This is before you could just hop over to Etsy and just order something and get something within a couple of days. My mom took me to a local like framing shop where they you know, had uh, various, uh, you know, framing services and all that. But one of the things they also had was a wall in there. They had all these uh, reproductions of famous artworks, posters that you could buy. And I remember going in that store and looking at the wall and looking at everything that was up there. And I don't remember what else was there, but I'm sure it was probably a bunch of like Warhol and Monet and things like that. But when I was scanning the wall, I came across this image here. And this image was just a poster with no type on it. Like it didn't say Ansel Adams on it. It didn't say where it was taken or when it was taken. It was just the image itself. Now, I highly doubt that it was like an official photograph. I'm sure it was probably just a copy that someone made. But, you know, nonetheless, there it was. And it was hanging in the store. And I remember looking at this on the wall and there was something about these boulders here in the front and this field of boulders with these beautiful mountains in the back. And also the like the symmetrical nature of it. The fact that you have like these two, uh, you know, like triangle pyramid shapes in the back with this larger rock centered uh, in the center of the frame here. And then, of course, you have this nice, uh, you know, a ray of light that's coming through here and these beautiful clouds in the back. I just thought it was awesome. And I remember just being uh, just so drawn to this image and I couldn't take my eyes off of this image and I couldn't really explain what it was about it or why. There was just something about it that just latched on to me. And I was like, that's the one like that is the image. And so I brought it home, hung it on my wall. And it remained on my wall for the rest of high school. I took it to college uh, where it, you know, it got, you know, fairly bent and kind of beat up in college. And then it even lasted with me into my into my 20s, you know, into like, you know, around like the mid 1990s. And then at some point, and this is the weird thing, I can't remember what happened to it. I think it got damaged. I think it just like eventually just kind of fell apart and, you know, got ripped and stained and whatever. And, but anyway, this photo was with me for a long, long time. And I didn't know anything about it. I mean, I knew that Ansel Adams took the photo. I mean, the, you know, I knew that much, but I didn't know where it was taken or, or when. It just looked like this, this like otherworldly landscape to me. It looked like a distant planet. And it's funny because I really haven't thought about this image um, since. And it wasn't until I got this book and I landed on this page and I looked at it and I realized like as soon as I saw the image, I mean, not only did I recognize the image, but I could now, I, I now knew exactly where this was taken. Like I didn't even have to look at the, the credit down here at the bottom. Like I looked at this and it immediately looked like, you know, the Eastern Eastern Sierras in Southern California. These rocks and boulders here in the front look like Alabama Hills, Lone Pine, 
uh, area, which I've been to before and photographed, it just immediately jumped out at me. I was like, oh, I know exactly where this is. And it turned out that was exactly right. It was taken just a few miles down the road in Manzanar, California in 1944. So in 44, that is when the uh, the Japanese uh, internment camps were uh, in Manzanar during the uh, during World War II. And Adams was there documenting um, uh, the uh, the Japanese prisoners of war who were uh, being held there. Uh, kind of a kind of a, a, a dark <laughs> point in American history. And while he was out driving around, it was on a dirt road that he saw these rocks and these mountains in the back and the light and everything. And so he got out, he put his camera on top of the car and took this photo literally from the side of the road. And I really do have to question today, you know, when I consider my own work and when I consider the landscape photography work. And by the way, I mean, back when I had this image, I never, never in, in my wildest dreams could have imagined going out and trying to create my own images. You know, like I thought, you know, images like these and, you know, were created by people who um, who weren't me, in other words. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. I never envisioned that this was something that I could actually go out and try my hand at and do myself. Like I thought this was something that other people did. And I have to wonder in retrospect how much influence this image has had on me over the years. Because again, I, I just really put it out of my mind. I totally forgot about it. But I really do just have a thing for geology and rock formations and these desert landscapes in the American West. Like it is one of my favorite places to go and photograph. And I don't know, I mean, maybe, maybe all roads you know, that I'm, that I'm currently traveling on, maybe everything leads back to this. Maybe everything leads back to this photo. And that day in the 1980s, when my mom took me to a local store to buy a poster and I saw this hanging on the wall. Okay, but anyway, uh, there are 399 other photographs in this book. I'm you know, not going to talk about all of them, of course, but there are some uh, particular images here that I think are really, really interesting that, uh, that I want to talk about. And I want to begin with one of his most uh, famous photos. Let me see if I can find it here. I'm sure you've seen this image at some point. Uh, this is one of his most famous images. This is uh, the Tetons and Snake River in Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, captured in 1942. In other words, like, you know, 80 some odd years ago, coming up on a century on some of these images in this book, which is just incredible to think about. But anyway, this photo is like one of those like classic landscape photography photographs that you know, is a template that I feel like everyone has followed at some point. I know I have. I've seen plenty of photos like this where you have this, you know, this this wonderful leading line of this river that begins in the lower right hand corner and just ebbs and flows through uh, the lower half of the frame. And then you have, you know, these wonderful peaks, uh, the uh, the Tetons back here in the back. And this river just really draws the eye into the back, partially because of how bright uh, the water is, because the sun is reflecting off of that water. And it just pulls your eye back into these surprisingly clear um, mountains. Like there was just you know, very little atmospheric haze or pollution, I would assume, in the air at that time. Adams definitely did not have the convenience of a dehaze slider like we have today. Um, but, you know, and then there's just these wonderful dramatic clouds and this light and everything else is, you know, cast in shadow. And, uh, and, you know, these areas aren't of particular importance. Everything is just really focused on that shape of the river leading back uh, into the peak. And it's just a classic image. It is one of those images that, like, follows the rules of, you know, leading lines and composition, you know, so closely that it, it's really hard to find fault in it. So, like, I think everyone could probably look at this and say, that's a great image. But the interesting thing about Adams and, and what really surprised me about his book is that, yes, he does have fairly conventional, fairly, you know, objectively beautiful images like these, but he also has some surprising images in here, images with surprising levels of of um, like images that are surprisingly contemporary and modern in comparison. And this one really took me by surprise. I have never seen this photograph before. And 
there's just something so wonderful about it. This is uh, just, it's just labeled as Mud Hills, Arizona. Um, this is just probably just some random area that he came across back in 1947. You know, remember this is 47. So, I mean, this is a time period in which, you know, there was no Photoshop. There was no, you know, like exposure blending or whatever else, all the digital tools and tricks that we have today. There was none of this back then. He was working purely with the camera and film and his darkroom of which he was you know, very skilled and capable, obviously, because he developed the whole zone system and all of that. But still, the thing that I love about this photograph is not only the photograph itself, but just knowing that this was an authentic, real moment when he was out in the field and he probably saw this light, you know, just hitting this little flat area here in the foreground, surrounded by these dark, uh, just, you know, almost like wave like, uh, you know, rock formations around it. And there's just something so simple and beautiful and minimal about it that and quiet that just really draws me into it that I just love. And I just think this is such a great photograph. It doesn't even look like the same photographer captured it. And there's another image in here too that I want to show you. And uh, let me see that other image is a, yep, it's uh, this one right here. Now you've probably seen this one before. This is another one of his more uh, well-known images though. Uh, I haven't seen it in a while. And when I saw it here in the book, it, uh, it really surprised me. And this was taken a number of years earlier. This was taken in 1932. I mean, just let that sink in for a moment. I mean, that was almost a century ago. And this, by the way, is one of the things that like, you know, if, if someone who, you know, doesn't know a lot about photography, if they ask me, you know, like, why landscape? You know, like, what is it about landscapes that's so interesting and draws you to it? For me, it's not just the environment and the subject matter and and uh, it attracts me to it. But it's also the the timeless nature of the images themselves. Because if you had told me this image was taken last week, I totally would have believed you. I would have no reason to to disbelieve you or to doubt you. And that is what is so wonderful about it. Even though this image was taken almost a century ago, it is in some ways timeless. It's kind of like a song that never gets old or a painting that never gets old. It never, it, it's not like, um, it's not attached to whatever the current style or trend is. It just has this timeless, eternal quality to it. So this photo, I think is remarkable. I think it's just absolutely incredible for a few reasons. First, we have this bright reflection on the water down here. And I would assume he probably did some dodging in the in the dark room here in order to really bring that out. But he totally obliterated any and all highlight detail that that was in that area. It's just essentially like this 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 uh, the shape that's just going across the bottom of the frame here that really helps anchor the image because what's going on above the waterline here is asymmetrical and is a little bit off balance. Um, though it does kind of have almost like a golden ratio kind of look to it. But, you know, the fact that you have, you know, like these, uh, you know, like these these rocks and the cliffs that are coming down and meeting the edge of the water here with this little bit of uh, snow mass here with, you know, some, you know, pebbles and rocks and little things that have chipped off the hill here. And the fact that this is off center here, you know, it's not, you know, if I had photographed this, I probably would have, you know, lined this up dead center and, you know, use that as my focal point. Whereas he intentionally let this drift over to the left side of the frame, which really emphasized this over here. So at first it kind of looks a little bit lopsided. It looks a little bit too heavy over here, but I think the, the tonal balance of everything, you know, that you have this nice tonality from the left uh, to the right and right to left that helps balance it. It doesn't feel too heavy on one side or the other. And I feel like this white reflection down here at the bottom really helps anchor the frame. And this is another image that I feel like is surprisingly uh, contemporary and surprisingly different. Here is uh, another couple of really good examples of what I'm talking about. Again, very contemporary in nature. And these images I do have to kind of question a little bit. And I do have to wonder if he pre-visualized these images this way when he was out in the field, or did these images just kind of you know, come together and did he see the potential in these images later when he was in the dark room? I mean, it doesn't really matter either way, but I just find it interesting you know, the way in the non-traditional way in which he composed these images, because you have, uh, because these, both of these images, again, no accident placing them side by side, both of them have just these very strong lateral 
patterns in this reflection here in the water of the of the mountain here and again it's almost like these bands of texture and detail in these different areas it's almost like a it's almost like a, like a rothko painting or something with these with these uh, these layers these vertical layers within the frame okay the next image um that i want to talk about is uh is this one here now what I find really interesting about the photographs in this book is that is that when he was shooting outdoors, which he you know <laughs> which is pretty much all the time, when he was shooting outdoors, he was primarily shooting in the middle of the day. You know, when the sun is bright, when the sun is really harsh and contrasty, he was not you know waiting for sunrise or waiting for sunset or prioritizing those times of day. Perhaps for practical reasons, because he was shooting in black and white and he wanted that high contrast look. But maybe also because you know cameras were probably more light starved back then than and film too for that matter than you know they are today with the digital technology that we have. But the thing that I notice in in a number of images and I feel like this is one of the best examples in the book is that he would use. Uh, light to his advantage. Even though it was high contrast, he would purposely compose his shot so that the images had layers, so that the image had a sense of depth to it. For example, this image here, we have you know a band of dark here, then uh, a brighter tone here, then dark, then bright, then dark, then bright, then dark, then bright. It's staggered. It's layered. There is depth to the photograph. And there are a number of images in here like this where he purposely uses these bands, these alternating bands of light and dark and light and dark throughout the frame in order to give the image some, some visual richness and depth and layering um, that otherwise wouldn't be there if he just, you know, maybe, you know, positioned more this way and shot it more with like, you know, the sun directly behind his back then it would just look you know completely flat so he always found ways to work with the light that he had and to use contrast to his advantage in order to create these layered uh images which i think is really interesting and i think it gives gives us something to be uh inspired by when we're out in the field in the middle of the day it's like oh the light's terrible like i can't shoot in this weather this is this is awful well you know you can obviously find ways to use it to your advantage because he absolutely did Okay, another uh, pair of images that uh, that I want to talk about is um, this one here. I thought this one was really interesting. Again, um, you know, again, a study in tonality because when you look at these images, they are exactly uh, they are the same tree, uh, the exact same tree, except this one was shot in 1944 uh, in autumn, and then this one is obviously shot in winter in 1948 in his favorite uh, location of all, uh, Yosemite National Park. Sometimes I don't recognize when I'm out in the field, like, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm shooting a particular subject, I don't notice how the tonal values of whatever is in the foreground are, are more or less the same as whatever is in the background. Like the colors could be different and the color may be throwing me off and thinking that, that it's gonna be obvious how different they are. But in 3D space, looking at it with the human eye, it looks like there's depth there. But then when you take a photo and get back and look at it, everything smushes down into a 2D flat plane. And when the tonal values are so close to each other, like if your subject is middle gray and your background is middle gray, it's just going to turn into mud, like with the two of them together. So there has to be some differentiation between the two in order for there to be depth in the image. And this is something that I feel like he used to great effect with these particular images, because you'll notice that the light is illuminating uh, the leaves on these trees here in the foreground. This is probably some side light coming from out of frame this way. But the peak in the back, uh, which is uh, Cathedral Rocks, these are in shadow. So you have the darker tonality of of the hill or the the uh, the rocks and the, and the cliff behind it, whatever you want to call it, behind the tree. But the leaves are all illuminating with that sun in the foreground. So you get that that separation between the two. And the other one, the other one taken in winter is the exact opposite of that. You have, you know, the sky that has been completely blown out with, you know, with snow that, you know, that's blowing around. And so it's rather foggy, rather misty. And here the leaves are darker, like they're, they're covered in snow, uh, but they are, uh, but the light, the way that the light is in this particular moment 
the leaves are darker. So we're able to uh, differentiate uh, the tree against the background. So again, he had a very sophisticated eye, I think, for depth uh, in the frame when he was taking images and he was thinking about the difference in tonality between what was in the foreground and what was in the background. Uh, speaking of, of uh, Yosemite, before we move on uh, to other images, one of the just general things that I want to say about his work, and one of the things that really stuck out to me, is just the sheer number of images that were captured in in like the backyard of where he lived, you know, which was obviously California. I mean, he did so much work in Yosemite, like uh, 60 to 70 percent of this book feels like it's Yosemite. And then he, you know, when he traveled, he only traveled like to neighboring states, like he would go over to Arizona, New Mexico, surprisingly few images in here of Utah, like why he didn't shoot more in Utah, or at least, you know, yeah, you know, there could be far more photographs that I haven't seen. Even though this one contains 400, there I'm sure there are more. But why there aren't more images from Utah when Utah is like one of the most fantastic uh, landscape photography states in the country? And and when he did travel, I mean, there's like a couple of images in here from like Alaska and one from Hawaii. But again, those are states. And I don't know if it was just the time period. I mean, again, this is like 30s, 40s, 50s, and you know, people just didn't you know get on a plane and travel like they do today. But it's worth mentioning and worth pointing out that he didn't travel to Iceland. He didn't travel to Greenland. He didn't go to Namibia. He didn't go to the Faroe Islands. He didn't, you know, go to like Chile or anything like that, like landscape photography hotspots. He didn't go to any of those places. Rather, he shot exactly where he was. Now, granted, where he happened to live is one of the most beautiful and fantastic states in the United States, that being California, of course. And California in many ways, it's like a country unto itself, not just not just culturally and economically and and everything else, but the sheer variety of landscapes that is just in that one state. I mean, you could, as evidence here, spend your entire life photographing that state and never grow tired of it and always find something interesting to photograph. So I'm bringing this up because I think it's interesting to think about when I feel like the you know, the the impulse is certainly there. I know I have it to like travel to far flung exotic landscapes and to, you know, and to go and, you know, do that type of work. But he created an entire body of work right where he lived, which I think is I, I think is, you know, an inspiring thing. OK, the next thing I noticed when looking through his images was how dominant um, the sky would oftentimes be in his photography. I don't know about you, but oftentimes when when I'm shooting landscapes, I think primarily about you know, what's on the ground. I think about, you know, what's in front of me, uh, you know, foreground, midground, background. And if the sky is a willing participant and if the sky is helping out and, and you know, and if the sky is good and the light is good and there's maybe some texture and detail up there. Awesome. Otherwise, well, you know, this is why we have sky replacement tools today, right? Because oftentimes the sky does not play along and the sky can be kind of bland or it can just, you know, it just doesn't really add anything to the frame or to the image. So for me, oftentimes I feel like I have kind of like a negative relationship with the sky because the sky more often than not just doesn't really, you know, do a whole lot for me. It's not helping the image. As a matter of fact, it kind of, you know, brings it down sometimes. But something that Adams would oftentimes do is that when there was something interesting happening in the sky and when the sky was beautiful and dramatic and he would primarily focus on the sky, like the sky would become the primary subject of the image. For example, like uh, this one here captured of a thunderstorm in New Mexico in 1937. I mean, the land, like the landscape, the actual land in front of him is what? Like maybe like 10% of the image and the other 90% of the image is this dark, beautiful sky up here above. But notice here, you know, how he also used light. Like, you know, the, the foreground down here is not, is not dark. He purposely shot this at a time when, uh, or he lucked out with the light, perhaps most likely, where you had this side light here that was uh, illuminating the side of um, of this valley that helps anchor the image and helps provide sufficient contrast for what's happening up here at the top. And I'm sure he probably did a sufficient amount of burning in the dark room in order to make this even darker and more uh, dramatic looking. But we see this in other uh, images too. This is another one of his most famous images. This is Moonrise, Hernandez, New Mexico, 1941. And again, just a small sliver of landscape down here at the bottom bright white streaking clouds across the side here, which is kind of similar to that earlier image with the water going across the bottom. And of course the moon and this deep, 
dark black sky above it. I mean, this is almost a topic within itself, but he was not afraid to push the sky all the way down into pure black. And here is another really good uh, example here. Again, the landscape is like 10% of the image once again. Beautiful sweeping uh, clouds, you know, across this valley here. Doesn't look like he spent too much time, you know, uh, you know, carefully composing the shot because we have this little shrub here on the edge of the frame, which is providing a little bit of friction, which uh, today someone using uh, Photoshop would probably use the remove tool and just kind of, you know, just kind of take that out. But back in the day, obviously that wasn't possible. So you just have this little sliver here and the sky is just this dramatic character. And again, man, he loved photographing the moon. Here we have uh, the moon once again. And then, of course, there is uh, High Country Crags and Moon, King Canyon National Park, California. Again, quite contemporary compared to other images that he captured. And, you know, this is such a, a, a great interplay of like, you know, light and dark and this almost like this like alter this uh, this uh, like prism like uh, beam of light that is being formed by this landscape here. And I'm sure that he probably Eh, you know, probably did a fair amount of burning with this foreground here. I mean, he pretty much like obliterated everything in the foreground here to match the tonality of the blue sky, which he just, you know, dropped all the way to black again with the moon, like in order to bring out that moon. One of the really interesting things about this photograph and one of the things that I can't forget now, you know, every time I look at this image, I'm going to think of this. I wrote about this in one of my newsletters, but there was a, a story in the New York Times a while back. If you're a subscriber, I'll link to that article down below if you'd like to check it out. But that story in the Times was about someone who became so infatuated with this image and just loved this image so much that they wanted to see it with their own eyes and not just go out and, you know, see this particular landscape, but they wanted to go out and photograph it in the exact same way that he did at the exact same time of year. Uh, and, you know, in order to find that out, she had to work with like astrologers and all like different people, some consultants who helped her figure this out. But they figured out because there was no official like date and time for this image or location, certainly no GPS coordinates. But she was able to figure out where the image was taken. You had to hike into it and she figured out the exact day, month and year and everything and when she should shoot it. Uh, today, like in 2022, I think it was when the article was, because she wanted to see this with her own eyes, because she wanted to see the shadow across the foreground and, and not to like copy it, but more, I think just mainly like to get underneath the mystery of it and just kind of um, perhaps develop in a, d a deeper appreciation for what Adams uh, created here by going out in the field and actually seeing it with her own eyes. At least that's my impression of a, uh, of the article, but you can read it for yourself if you are a uh, subscriber to the Times. You have to be a subscriber. Unfortunately, it's behind a paywall, but I'll uh, I'll link it down there if you'd like to check it out. Oh, by the way, I'm just flipping through the book, but here's another great example of the way he used sky, right? I mean, again, thin band of landscape across the bottom and this wonderful sky up here in the top 80 to 90 percent of the frame. And again, with this moon here, probably a fair amount of uh, uh, burning um, involved here in order to create the look of this image. But again, it was a technique that he that he utilized quite often. OK, we could talk about this book all day long and and about, you know, his contribution to landscape photography. And I really haven't even talked about like some of his most, you know, famous images like the ones that he captured, uh, like around Yosemite Valley, you know, images that have been emulated and um, you know, recreated endless times. I mean, I went to like, you know, talking about this one, of course, here, like of, you know, Yosemite Valley. I went there a number of years ago. It was like a hill of photographers. There was like, or, you know, just people who were there to photograph it. And there was like all these tripods on the hill and everyone was sitting around waiting uh, for the light to get good and take a photo. And it, it was almost like a tailgating party for like a football game or something. I mean, there's just all these people just hanging out and just sitting around waiting for the light. It was really quite weird. I didn't really know what to think about. It. I mean, I, you know, I, I did my thing. I took a photo and, you know, and then I like moved on. Like it was one of those things where I was like, okay, never want to do that again. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about uh, is trees. Now he photographed a number of trees, especially around Yosemite Valley. Uh, you know, here are a couple of examples here. Uh, aspen trees, uh, obviously a very good subject for black and white with the white bark on the tree and the dark shadowy background. Uh, looks like he did a fair amount of uh, burning on the edges here in order to bring these out in the foreground. 
taken in uh, New Mexico. And I think there's, yep, another example here. Uh, this one uh, looks like redwood trees. Yeah, redwoods up in Northern California. And the thing that I noticed is that over and over again, when he was photographing trees, here's another wonderful example here with this nice symmetry across the frame and equal you know, margins, you know, especially on the, the left and the right side. The thing that I noticed over and over again, and you may have noticed as well, but just by looking at these images, is that when he was photographing trees, he did not shoot them at eye level. He didn't do the, the standard thing that I think most people do, or at least I know I do. You know, you kind of get eh, like a little bit you know, lazy with it. Like you go out, you set up your tripod, you raise the camera up to eye level because then it's comfortable because then you can look through the back of the camera directly and you're not hunched over or you're not squatting down on the ground or whatever. But one of the things that can happen when you're shooting at eye level, especially when you're shooting with a wide angle lens, is that the foreground in front of you, when you're when the camera's up that high, the foreground underneath you can kind of like bend underneath the camera like so. And sometimes that can be used to, you know, with great dramatic and creative effects because then the foreground, you know, was directly in front of the camera can kind of stretch and bend underneath. And then you get this nice, you know, drama if that's what you're going for. If there is something of particular interest in the foreground and the midground and background is not particularly interesting or, or important, that can be nice. Other times it can work against you. Like it's one of the reasons why I don't always like wide angle because I don't like you know, the big foregrounds and the and the tiny little backgrounds when the background is usually what I'm most interested in. But anyway, one of the things that I noticed here is that the camera is almost always just like, you know, like two feet off the ground, maybe like this is another really good example here. He was not shooting these at eye level. He put the camera down low and just letting the trees ascend through because then that distortion is not going to be as noticeable and I think it I think it just it looks really nice and so this is something that I I feel like I've probably made the mistake of uh, in the past of shooting primarily at eye level when probably should have gotten the camera down a little bit lower okay so uh, obviously we could spend uh, all day talking about uh, Ansel Adams and his work and his contribution to uh, landscape photography and the importance of his work there are many many more images in this book and if you are interested in checking this book out I bet you could probably pick up a used copy for pretty cheap I know I did or if you want a brand new one of course you could do that as well either way I'll link to it down below in the video description if you would like to check out uh, 400 photographs from Ansel Adams I think it's definitely worth uh, picking up that's it for me everyone I hope you enjoyed the video I am by no means uh, an expert on, you know, his work or, you know, what he's contributed or what he created. But, um, you know, I wanted to at least share some of the things that I've noticed, uh, some of the things that I picked up on in the hope that it'll help you, um, you know, with your own photography, because there are many lessons uh, I know for me in this book and many things that I'm picking up on and thinking about after checking this book out. So I appreciate you being here. If you enjoyed the video, please uh, do me a favor and give this video a thumbs up down below. And if you would like to hang out with me again in the future, remember to subscribe as well. And uh, we will do it again. Thanks so much for being here. See you next time.